almost everything I've written so that you can, in fact, read it later if you want to. I should start by saying I do not have um, extensive training in the field of software or technology engineering, and some of you do. So know that in our discussion, it will be interactive. There'll be opportunities for you to ask questions, share thoughts, and I hope it's a somewhat collaborative experience for you. But these are coming out of, honestly, God has blessed us with four children. They're uh, in virtual school. They're, they want Leapster. They want had handheld devices. And we're wrestling ourselves with how do we navigate those things wisely with biblical wisdom and what principles would be helpful to us. So we're trying to learn those on our own. All right, the, your opening heading technology can be a great good. And so I hope my tone throughout these four lessons will not be the curmudgeon who's talking about when I was in my day sort of thing. But we'll be thinking through wisely how to ask some careful questions that maybe we would otherwise presuppose because this is the only world we've known. Maybe it's an overused analogy, but the old analogy of asking a fish what water is and they don't get it. And in a sense, asking us what technology is, we can't really imagine a life without it. Now, even technological advances in the broadest sense, which have been wonderful, have sometimes had unintended consequences. For example, automobiles, great thing, but when they were invented, they had some unintended consequences on social fabric, on familial relationships. Or dishwashers, great thing. People are like, wow, this is going to save me so much time. And yet they found that it's possible to be busier with that extra time. Uh, and then the incandescent light bulb, great thing, right? The Industrial Revolution maximized the light bulb, but it also meant that then employers could have you work much longer hours, and then, then they eventually had to come up with labor laws to protect employers uh, really taking advantage of their employees because of that technological good. So I just use those three simple examples to say these things that can be blessings can also be challenges. So uh, then I want to narrow our focus though. When I talk about technology, I won't spend any time on dishwashers. Um, you can ask my wife the last time I loaded ours. I actually put in the gel rather than like the actual dishwashing soap and she called and said there's bubbles all over the floor. What, <laughs> what did you do? So I'm not very good at that technology. But I'm going to narrow our conversation on handheld devices mainly, smartphones, that sort of thing, and some observations that are being made there. So uh, if you're on the notes, we're at the bottom of the first main page of lesson one, technology in the young, the alarm has been sounded. So if you turn the page, you should see a heading that says parents pleading for help. And I'm going to quote some of the authors that I've read. Andy Crouch writes this, parents know we need help. We love the way devices make our lives easier and the stress and busyness that fill our days. We love the way screens can almost magically Absorb our children's attention and give us a few moments of quiet in the car or before dinner. Boy, I can relate, certainly. We admire the ease with which our children master technology, the prowess they show with video games, the burst of creativity in the arts, movies, and music that devices help them produce. But we also sense the precious days of childhood are passing by far too fast in a haze of ghostly blue light. And we watch as the inevitable intensity of teenage relationships is raised to near toxic levels by a sleep depriving, round the clock deluge of messages. We feel helpless to prevent them from overexposure far too early to the most violent and intimate facts of life. And so you'll see your first pie chart there on the bottom of the page. Parents of children ages four to 17 were polled across the country and they strongly agreed, you see 44%, that raising kids today is more complicated than when they were a kid in large part because of technology. So if you turn the page, you'll see the next graphic. What makes it more difficult to raise kids today? And in, in this question, they were marking multiple options so they could select more than one. So if you're a math major, you're right. 65 plus 52 is more than 100%. So it's not the normal breakdown. You could, collect, you could click more than one, but notice the overwhelming thing was technology or social media. So that was what parents in particular were afraid of. So uh, I will admit, though I very much believe as a Christian who believes in the gospel, the message that God sent his son 
to die for our sins. Uh, I very much believe that the cross leads to the empty tomb that leads to joy. And in a similar way, tonight's lesson and the four weeks will first share sort of the dark bad news, but don't get overwhelmed by that. We are going to go to good news. But as I record some of the sounding alarms, there are some like disappointing things that we have to think through first. I've come up with 10 based on the reading that I've done. I feel really cheesy that I came up with 10. It feels like t 10 tips to, <laughs> to live by. But these are actually just the 10 that I came up with. So we're going to get to solutions, but first we have to talk about the sounding alarm. So now you should see a heading that says technology's downside. And we're going to look at some broad considerations. Here's the first one that I wrote, the tyranny of the urgent. This year, Georgetown University professor of computer science, Cal Newport, lamented in it, this change in his book, A World Without Email. And here's what he's especially concerned about. There was once a day in American history, you may not even remember it yourself, but there was once a day where in American history, going to the mailbox was an exciting experience. <laughs> you only did it once. It might have been way at the end of your driveway and people looked forward to it. What did I get in the mail? But is that how email feels for most people? No, in fact, it feels burdensome, annoying, consistently as if you have to respond to it. Now, to be fair, some professions sort of require you to respond all the time. I was at a school recently that had two uh, greeters, if, if you will, right inside, and, and their role really is to respond to people immediately. But many professions that require sustained thought, if you allow emails to enslave you, you will not be able to think very well or very consistently. And that's essentially what Cal Newport is concerned about. But Matt Richtel, in his humorous true story in the New York Times, records what happens. If you'll turn the page, because uh, I think we're on the same page, I'll read his story. He writes, recently, this is a true story, Mrs. Brenda Campbell was baking peanut butter cookies for Teacher Appreciation Day when her phone chimed in the living room. She answered a text, then became lost in Facebook, forgot about the cookies, and burned them. <laughs> she started a new batch, heard the phone again, got lost in messaging, and burned those too. Out of ingredients and shamed, she bought cookies at the store. <laughs> and this is essentially what can happen in the tyranny of the urgent that technology causes. Tony Rinke records, we check our smartphones about 81,500 times each year. That is once every 4.3 minutes of our waking lives. And so again, another graph for you. The question for parents of children's ages 4 to 17 was, in what ways? As technology made your life more difficult, select all that apply. Notice the first three. I waste a lot of time. I'm more distracted. My devices separate me from other people. Notice the fourth one. I feel like I can never disconnect. The fifth one, I feel like my attention span is shorter. The sixth, I feel less productive. The seventh, I feel anxious when not with my phone. So almost all of the answers were something about an overwhelming anxiety because of the tyranny of the urgent that the technology actually creates. So moving to the next one, number two, desensitization. Uh, Neil Postman, I will admit, is a major influence on me in this conversation. He is deceased now, and he first wrote his book, Amusing, Our Amusing Ourselves to Death, in 1985. His son, uh, helped rewrite the forward to it in about 2010, if I recall. No, it's on the bottom, 2005. So it's actually, by current standards, sort of out of date. I mean, 16 years ago, right? And yet, he turned out to be prescient in a lot of the concerns he had. Here's what he wrote back in 1985 under desensitization. Neil Postman observes a frightening practice in the news, which he calls now dot, 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 this. And he explains, now this is the phenomenon whereby the reporting of a horrific event, a rape, or a five alarm fire, or a global warming, is followed immediately by the anchors cheerfully exclaiming, now this, which segues into a story about a trivial matter or a commercial for light beer, creating a sequencing of information so random, so disparate in scale and value as to be incoherent, even psychotic. Technology as a medium does not work the way communication worked previous to it. Because it moves so quickly and so rapidly, it truncates a human response that would be fitting for the news that you're hearing. And how could it not? Because it's moving within seconds to the next thing. 
uh, I forget who it was. He was on like the Walter Cronkite show or whatever that news thing was a, a ways back. And they started to have a careful exchange of thought. And when he was about to say something meaningful, he said, well, I guess we have to cut to commercial in 30 seconds. But then the news host said, actually, 10 seconds. <laughs> that is sort of the way ideas work when they're communicated on a technological raft. In other words, other boats can communicate ideas at the right pace. But the advancements we're in move at such a swift pace, they cannot allow the space to breathe for proper thought. All right, number three. Image replaces proposition. When style outshines substance, then the medium replaces the message. Whether careful discourse be written or spoken, ideas can hardly be carefully considered in a soundbite culture which is bent on titillation and haste. Just as you cannot do philosophy through smoke signals, you cannot make profound arguments through images. Imagery as a form cannot clearly convey the content of complex propositions. It simply can't bear the weight of the complexities of a thorough argument. Now, I'll summarize the next paragraph for you. Some of you that like political history will know that the first presidential election that used the television was when JFK was running. And JFK looked really good on camera. And he knew how to dress well. He thought carefully about what suit color would contrast well with his skin tone, and he used it to his great advantage when he was running. But no one had ever done that before. So previous to JFK, if you were running for the highest office in the free world, the only way you could be judged was on your ideas. Your ideas had to be heard through the radio or read in print. But once JFK ran, how you looked started to matter. And before long, how you looked mattered more than what your ideas actually were. Postman, again, gives us a warning here. He writes about our 27th president, William Howard Taft, and I'll just pick up here in his quote. He could be put forward as a presidential, he could not be put forward as a presidential candidate in today's world. Because today, the shape of a man's body is largely irrelevant to the shape of his ideas when he's addressing the public in writing or on the radio, or in smoke signals even. But today, it's quite relevant on television or in imagery. For on television, discourse is conducted largely through visual imagery, which is to say that television gives us conversation in images, not words. So now the next one, number four, the dilution of intimacy. And I'm about to make some comments about Amazon Alexa, full disclosure, I own an Amazon Alexa, <laughs> okay? But number four, the dilution of intimacy. In 2018, Amazon's digital voice assistant, Alexa, crashed. And Alexa's crash came because of overloaded requests, including confessions such as, Alexa, I'm depressed. In fact, over 50% of human interactions with Alexa go beyond simple command fulfillment, including one of the most common phrases said to Alexa, Alexa, I feel lonely. In our house, the most common phrase said to Alexa is, Alexa, play baby shark. <laughs> but in American life, unfortunately, Alexa's some of the most common phrases said to it are actually about our emotional harm or concern, meaning we're turning to a robot in the room, which we silly call a human name, and share personal feelings with it. In fact, many in younger generations have a mental category for disembodied connection that would have been incomprehensible to their previous generations. So previous generations would have thought of connections only in flesh or in person, or someone that you actually know. But generations today have a category for a relationship that was never personal, that was disembodied, and don't see it as unusual. This is an example of that. Now, you may not know that to make digital devices more human, tech companies have worked to make digital creations like Alexa take on a more emotionally considerate or therapeutic vocal tone. And if you read the footnotes I have there from The Atlantic and The Wall Street Journal, they detail how the creators of Alexa worked very hard to give Alexa a therapist sort of speech, tone, and demeanor so that you would open up to it more than you normally might. A consequence of technology, therefore, has been a dilution of intimacy that has often confused a facsimile of connection with real embodied intimacy. Now, I gave you a long Tony Rinke quote underneath here, and I won't read all of it. But perceived intimacy with technology 
ironically isolates humans from one another. And Tony Rinke does some research to show that all technological advances in the main have done this even if that was not their original intention. So if you'll jump uh, to the third paragraph there. As technology improves, machines replace people and automation replaces interaction. You probably remember these changes in your own life. Street vendors gave way to vending machines. Fresh milk deliveries gave way to dairy products preserved in refrigerators. Bankers gave way to ATMs. The community cinema, which we may never see those again, <laughs> gave way to a large shared television in each family's home, which gave way to portable televisions and now to personal LED TVs in every bedroom or indeed in everyone's hand. Attending a live orchestra performance on a Saturday evening was for many people replaced by a stationary phonograph, a record player. But then that was replaced by a transistor radio. That was replaced by a portable transistor radio. That was replaced by a boom box with open speakers carried on the shoulder. But then that was replaced by the Walkman. That was replaced by a tiny iPod clipped to the sleeve. And then music went from a social community experience to a shared family experience to a private earbud experience. The next page for me, anyway. Many of these technological trajectories converge in the smartphone, the supreme invention of personal isolation. His point is simply not to be a curmudgeon, really, but just to simply show that technology does have a, a breakdown of social fabric, with maybe not even intending to do so. Number five, and this one for me was perhaps the most intriguing, brain drain or overstimulation. This Time Magazine article by Haley Sweetland Edwards is outstanding, so I encourage you to read it, but I'll read a fair amount of it to you today. Every day we check our phones an average of 47 times. That's every 19 minutes, but we already shared earlier that the speed has actually gone up. Many of us are seized these days with a feeling that that's not good. Last year, the American Psychological Association found that 65% of us believe that periodically unplugging would improve our mental health. The University of Texas calls it a full-blown epidemic. All right, but here's what I want you to notice. Silicon Valley has actually intentionally made technology addictive. Because every second you spend on a screen means more money for the creators that sell your personal data to those who want to advertise to you. Those designing technology have intentionally designed their technology to manipulate and persuade users to stay beyond their original intention. So now notice the big quote underneath. Every major consumer tech company operating today, from behemoths like Amazon to Candy Crush, uses what's called persuasive technology. Most of the time, the goal is unambiguous, spend as much time as possible. Facebook, for example, is not neutral. Its designers determine which videos, which news stories, which friends' comments appear at the top of your feed, as well as how often you're informed of new notifications. Snapchat distributes, or distributes badges to users who maintain daily streaks, a nifty system built on a human's well-studied psychological need to bank progress. They, they then note, your kid is not weak-willed because he can't get off his phone. Your kid's brain is being engineered to get him to stay on his phone. If you turn the page, you'll see the next point. Uh, let me just observe here at this point, fairly frequently, I'll talk to even adults who feel very, very drained. They feel very, very tired, unusually tired. And most of the time, those adults, if, if I was to ask them, do you believe your life is busier than a frontier man or woman who moved from the East Coast and went west in a covered wagon of which three-fifths of the women were pregnant in the journey from the East to the West to San Francisco. Do you think your life is busier than that person? They would normally concede, no, I don't. But then how is it that we genuinely are not just perceiving that we're more tired, but are in fact more tired than previous generations? And I think the answer may be because the screens are meant to drain us in ways that we're not even considering. Now, uh, I'm going to share some of this with you, but jump to the second paragraph of the uh, big quote that I have there, okay? Most of the alluring apps and websites in wide use today were engineered to exploit this habit-forming loop. Snapchat relies heavily on trigger, action, re reward, triumvirate, and the brain can be stimulated this way and, and taken advantage of. It uses a powerful trick to get users to open the app daily. 
When two people send and receive snaps with each other for days on end, both receive emoji flames next to their names, alongside a number, which ticks up every 24 hours, indicating how long the two have maintained the connection. If either misses a day, both lose their flame. Now that interface, while playful, capitalizes on what psychologists call the endowed progress effect. Fearful of zeroing out their bank progress, teenagers have handed over their login information to friends before vacations. Pinterest, one of the first Silicon Valley firms to hire behavioral psychologists to work alongside designers, plays on our psychology in a different way. Its interface, which features an endless scroll of pictures arranged in staggered jigsaw-like pattern, is human catnip. <laughs> it ensures that users always see at least a partial image of what comes next, which tantalizes our curiosity and deprives us of any natural stopping point, while simultaneously offering an endless well of new content. Brown and Combs refer to this as a bottomless bowl design, a reference to the 2005 Cornell University study that found that participants ate 73% more soup when their bowls secretly self-refilled. Dozens of other apps employ similar interfaces. No matter how long you scroll down on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, and no matter how many hours you spend watching YouTube or Netflix, there's always more content queued up on autoplay. So as I write in my sentence at the bottom, many technology apps then are actually not designed neutrally, but manipulatively. So they're not actually intended to be neutral. They're intended to take advantage of you. Now, if you read that whole article, here's what you'll find that's really interesting. There was a guy, I think he was at USC or UCLA, one of those two, and he was teaching PhD seminars on the behavioral uh, addiction problem that happens with technology. And he spent his whole life trying to help free people from technology. And in his class was a doctoral student who reverse engineered what he was trying to use to free people and realized, but if I use it the opposite way, then I can use it to keep people. And he invented Pinterest. That's actually the story behind it. So the guy who sat in the class on how to make sure we don't connect people to the things we use took those principles, used them the opposite way to keep people longer than they ever intended when they get on the app. He figured out how to reverse game the system. Now here's the objection I often hear at this point. Josh, come on. Everything's neutral. Everything's neutral. I mean, technology is not good or bad. It's neutral. It's just how you use it. And that's slightly true, but the premise I can't totally embrace. Here's why. Today I had lunch outside under the tree over there, and I took with me a butter knife to cut the apple that I was eating. Now, you could say that a butter knife is a neutral item, that it could be used as a weapon. It could be used to harm people. Now, if you were to compare a butter knife as neutral in the same way that a tank is neutral, <laughs> they're both able to be used multiple different ways. That's not quite accurate, is it? Because one was designed to actually spread butter. And though it could be used dangerously, a tank could not spread butter very easily, but it could cause destruction very easily. My point is simply this. Can technology be used in a good way or bad? Of course, I'm not against using technology. But were apps all made with the same design? Not at all. Some are actually designed in such a way to manipulate you. For example, if you're opening Snapchat, the design behind it is not the same as opening the calculator on your smartphone. You see? They're not designed in the same way. One's designed to get you to do something that the other's not designed to get you to do. So they're not equally neutral, would simply be my point. Here's a sixth, perhaps unintended, consequence of technology. And that is what C.S. Lewis wisely called chronological snobbery. And what Lewis meant by that is that we all naturally think only about our own moment. And in order to fight thinking like only our own moment, we need to read old books. So here, I'll quote him. It's a good rule after reading a new book never to allow yourself another new one till you have read an old one in between. Every age has its own outlook. It's especially good at seeing certain truths and especially liable to certain mistakes. We all, therefore, need the books that will correct the characteristic mistakes of our own period. None of us can fully escape this blindness, but we shall certainly increase it and weaken our guard against it if we only read modern books. The only palliative is to keep the clean sea breeze of the centuries blowing through our minds, and this can only be done by reading old books. 
Now, I won't quote the next one. I'll just paraphrase it. Sometimes people object to, to Lewis and others like him. But wait, all history is progress. New is by definition better than old. Things always get better, don't they? To which Lewis responds, if a clock is at the wrong time and you need to turn it back, you didn't go in the wrong direction by turning it back. You put it at the right time. So something might be correct forward or backward. Its forwardness or backwardness is not what makes it right or wrong. The ideas themselves stand on their own. Number seven, the entertainment of all things. Those reading Neil Postman's work 25 years later were in a college group, and Liz wrote this. In class, we asked ourselves, now that there's cable, are there channels that are not just about entertainment? We tried to find one. One kid said the Weather Channel, but another mentioned how they have all these shows on tornadoes and try to make weather fun. The only good example we came up with was C-SPAN, which no one watches, <laughs> which I thought was good. So the reminder that technology just has a way of sensationalizing everything. And in fact, it's so pervasive that as I share here, a Christian magazine had a cover that really is modeling like a cosmopolitan cover. And so it has titles like top 10 tips on getting closer to God. But who am I to critique? I came up with 10 points today myself. So, Number eight, the elimination of shades and see-through blinds. Are you familiar with the story that's in the Supreme Court right now? A 14-year-old girl was very upset that she got cut from her cheerleading team and didn't make varsity. And so she went home and she got on Snapchat. And with vulgarity that, of course, I cannot endorse, she had a rant. In frustration, she talked about how much she hated her school and her coach. But Snapchat ostensibly deletes everything in 24 hours. But of course, you guys know, anything you put on the internet never deletes. <laughs> so someone took a screenshot of it and sent it to the school and sent it to her, her teacher, the one who had cut her. And then she was suspended from school for the entire year. Now that case is in the Supreme Court right now because the question is this. Can something you say in private be used at a public school to eliminate you from the school for the whole year? And my simple point is this. There once was a day where if you got angry and said some things in your bedroom, they were in your bedroom. Or if you were at the playground and complained about some things, they were at the playground. Young people typically don't realize that there is no private space if it's on the digital world. And that's why I've named number eight, the elimination of shades and see-through blinds. In our homes, we can close the shades. We can close the blinds. But in the digital world, you never can, which is a hugely important thing in terms of how we parent our children on digital devices. Uh, number nine, we'll jump to that one. The diminishment of observation and reflection. I'll just read the, the first point. The average output, this is the Tony Rinke quote, the average output of email and social media text is estimated at 3.6 trillion words, or about 36 million books typed out every day. In comparison, the Library of Congress holds 35 million books. So every day on social media, more output is being made than the entirety of the Library of Congress. The question is, is it of equal value? And I, I don't know who would argue that it is. <laughs> so a consideration further on that, and I'll just kind of paraphrase what we have here. The two popular dystopian novels, George, or George Orwell's 1984 and L. Dewey Huxley's Brave New World, kind of had competing visions of a dystopian future. George Orwell's essentially was government takeover would take everything away from you. L. Dewey Huxley's essentially was government will give you such a proliferation of options that they will take everything away from you by giving you more than you could ever possibly sift through. That is what information overload means. Uh, Kevin DeYoung put it in a way that really stuck with me years ago when he said, in our current moment, we have more knowledge and less wisdom than any other time in human history. And I think he's hitting on something correct. These are all warnings that have been given by many over the years. So the diminishment of observation and reflection. Will you turn the page to the picture? What do you see in that picture? What's happening? Right. <laughs> That's right. 
So here you have a beautiful painting that could be benefited by examining its beauty, noticing its texture, appreciating its smell, noticing all the artwork, the meaning, the intentionality, the structure, the care. And yet everybody in the picture who's a young person is instead looking down on their phone. One of the books I read about this gave us this analogy. Have you ever seen pictures, they're normally black and white ones, from like the 1920s on a plane? You'll notice that in that era on a plane, a very small cabin, virtually everybody is smoking a cigar or a cigarette, and there are babies in their hands. So when they're in this small cabin circulating the same air, everybody's smoking to which most of us today, about 100 years later, would say, those people were crazy. But probably 100 years from now, if people had a picture of us at a beautiful green sunny park, most of the people in the picture would be looking down at their phone, to which it's fair to ask, would they think, those people were crazy. So pictures like this are really helpful. Have you ever seen the one where it's, I think, when the Oculus Rift came out, which is that headset VR technology that you put over your eyes? And they're at one of those like uh, Comic-Con, South by Southwest, Southwest uh, conventions. And everybody has these rifts on, on their eyes. And walking in front of them, but nobody saw him, was Mark Zuckerberg. So all these people who would just geek out over Mark Zuckerberg, no one knew he was there because all of them had this over their eyes. So number nine can, uh, can be one for us to think about. There's a sense in which we can diminish observation and reflection beyond what we mean to. All right, I know these are hard. We will get to good news, I promise. <laughs> Number 10, last uh, observation, the illusion and allurement of anonymity. And this one, I think, is especially important for children. Digital technology has falsely led young people to believe that since they're behind a screen, they can behave with impunity. This perception of anonymity is not actually reality, see point number eight. But young people especially can fail to realize that their digital activity can be called into account so they may behave with less restraint in a digital world than they would in reality. Martha Pickerel reports for Time, anonymity, or at least the absence of in-person reprisals, emboldens some kids to pick on others over social media or text messages. Some statistics show that 33% of teenagers report having been cyberbullied, while others put the figure near 15%. Some older kids also engage in sexting, sending suggestive or partially clothed photos via smartphone, content that can later be used to bully the sender. Kids' basic safety is the main reason for the proliferation of tools to monitor and limit their digital activities. Now, in the weeks to come, uh, Spencer in particular, I think, will give us some guidance on ways to use technology wisely. Maybe this is a good time for me to float out one that we use in our home. So for the record, we have digital devices in our home, and we have not perfectly figured out how to use all of them. The one thing we do have that is very helpful on every electronic device we have is a software called Covenant Eyes, which monitors and snaps active pictures of literally everything everyone does, meaning that there's never a moment on our television, our laptop, my smartphone, or a tablet that anyone is truly private in what they're doing. All of it's known, all of it's seen by the whole family. And that's, a, I think, a helpful way to reinforce to our children and to, to me and to my wife that this is a communal shared experience. You will have no private life online that you couldn't account for in public life. All right, uh, next kind of segue. So I shared 10 dark, scary things that are sad. We are going to get to good news. Um, I'm sorry to be the one that has to sound the alarm in, in, verse, in, in lesson one, or at least report the alarm that others are sounding. But here, you could ask this, Josh, maybe it's all just a matter of taste. Maybe it's just how we come to our own conclusions. Now, here is what I want you to notice. Urs Gasser, John Palfrey, I read their uh, interview on their book, The Connected Parent, an Expert Guide to Parenting in Digital World. They were interviewed by the Harvard Gazette, and they were generally favorable of children and youth using technology. They thought it was very positive. Neil, Neil Postman, the author of Amusing Ourselves to Death, was very negative in his assessment of technology's influence. But here's what I'd want you to note. All of those authors are thoroughly non-Christian. They're thoroughly non-Christian, and yet they can't seem to agree on technology's assessment or its value. And the reason is because they have underlying different answers to the underlying questions behind these things. 
So look now at some questions that I've given you. Does technology mainly liberate or enslave people? You'd have to answer that on your own. Does it improve or degrade democracy? Does it make leaders more or less accountable? Does it make systems more or less transparent? Does it make us better citizens or consumers? But those questions are actually unpacking more foundational questions, and I think it's a turn of the page for me. What questions are behind even those ones? And I think they are as follows. Why do we exist? What is the good life? What is worth living for? What would be true success if I achieved it? And what are some dangers to then living well? Or is there any hope even to live well? And so at this point, we're going to pause and be interactive for a moment. In front of you, hopefully you have a pen, and then you have a space for you to write some things down. So let's take a couple minutes. I have not written down in advance because I'm going to do the exercise with you myself. But with a pen, take a couple of moments. You can talk to someone at your table, bounce some ideas around, and answer these questions. After we're done, we'll have some discussion before we get to the last section I have for us tonight. So write down letter C, and I'm going CBA on purpose. What are ways technologies help you live well? And I'm sure there are some, no doubt. What are some concerns you have? Maybe you had them before you came tonight. Maybe they've been peaked when we went through those 10 things. And what goals do you have? What do you want to achieve? And how would technology contribute to them? All right, so go ahead and do that now. And uh, feel free to talk to the people at your table, kick it around, or think through it quietly. I'm going to write some answers for myself as well. I can tell you're a very chatty crowd. Try to keep it down at your table. <laughs> In about a minute, though, I will ask you to speak out loud, if you're willing. So take time and write some more things down, and then we'll kick them around out loud. I'm doing it live with you, so uh, I'm thinking through them on the top of my head as well. All right, let's do it. Who wants to shout out or share one from letter C, benefits? What are some ways technology has been a blessing to you? It's been helpful. It's been beneficial in various ways. Yeah, that's the first one I wrote too. That's the first one I wrote too. When I, uh, 
when I was in college, I worked for the post office, and it was before the smartphone. And so I remember at, when you're in college working for the post office, you don't have the same route every day. You get a new route every day. And you often do multiple routes. And so they would give me this very grainy two-dimensional map of some scary place in Detroit. And I'd have to go there. And half the time, it was upside down. And I love the navigation feature on the phone. Yeah, totally agree. It's a good one. What else? How else has uh, technology been beneficial? And no doubt it has been in many ways. So. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Google Hangouts. Yeah, things like that. She said, you can see people you don't live near. I, I agree, but I'm kind of chuckling because I put Google Hangouts on my parents' phone. They still live in Michigan. I live here, and they can never figure out how to answer it, ever. <laughs> ever. Not once, though. In theory, you can see people you don't live near. Yeah, that's good. That is a good one, though, I think. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, so you can have photos that uh, can, can keep pace. I love the Jim Gaffigan line. He was on, he was on a talk show, and he, <laughs> he was saying that uh, I have more pictures of my kids than my father ever looked at me, <laughs> which, is, which is a great line. But you're right. We do have a lot of pictures uh, that can sustain memory. Good. What else? Yes, definitely. Uh, man, I'm trying to fix something at my house right now, and the YouTube videos are very helpful for me. So, yeah, very true. What else? And there are a lot of blessings, and we should rejoice in those, even if we acknowledge some dangers. Yeah. You can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're talking about things you can buy, not. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. I'm just teasing you. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, my, when my wife got the Target app, I was concerned. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. What else? There, there are good things we should rejoice in, them, for sure. They're a blessing. Yeah, there are a lot of things that are easier. Um, so I have several thousand physical books, but I have more thousand digital books. And when you have them on a screen, it actually can be very helpful, especially if you're a missionary and you don't have to load thousands of books in a plane, but they're on a laptop. So there are things like that that can be really beneficial. Yes. Yes, no doubt. Yeah, no doubt. There are lots of good things we can access when we use it judiciously that we otherwise wouldn't be able to access. Very good. Does anyone listen to Audible books? Anybody? That's really, I love that. So that's helpful for me. Uh, kind of, sort of. <laughs> yeah. I read faster, honestly, than Audible books, but I like them when you're driving. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yes. That's a great point. I read a book. Um, it's a really provocative title. It's called Why Johnny Can't Preach, which <laughs> is very, it was a good book. But he shared that uh, you know, when, when a president had a speech in the newspaper age, you would read the entire speech. And then it was the radio age, you might have six or seven minutes. And now it's a sound bite of like 30 seconds. But podcasts actually have swung us back to that day of a sustained thought, which is a great, great thing. That's a very good point. What else? Any other blessings? There are others, I'm sure. All right, let's go to letter B. What dangers did you think of? Things that maybe you're concerned of. Maybe they were included in the 10. Maybe there are other ones that are, man, I know wisdom will not die with me, so you maybe thought of some stuff I did not think of. So that'd be great. Yeah, that is a concern, too. Yeah, will the bubble burst? And if so, what might the collateral be? Great point. Great point. What else? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there sometimes is a sense in which, yeah, I mean, if I'm being honest, partly why I'm concerned about it is because I'm so weak-willed. <laughs> so, so it's not like I'm coming at this from strength. I'm actually coming at it, sadly, from knowing through experience how much I struggle. And so, yeah, really well said. Good. Yeah, I wrote down unfiltered access. I definitely fear that for my children. You know, you, there are things you don't want them to see or hear that you may not be able to keep them from seeing or hear, even if you think you've been really careful. My wife and kids were watching a, a you know, it's a Disney Junior show the other day, 
and they introduced some heavy concepts that were not over my children's head. And it, it brought up some difficult conversations for us that I did not anticipate having when they're four year, years old. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. That's so good. Yep. Yes. Yeah. And a lot of parents are in that spot already and are concerned about that. And let's not lie either. We're in a culture that currently is digging up things from 20 or 30 years ago. So there's no denying that that's the reality. That's a great point. Any others? Anybody have? Yeah. Yes, that's a great point. That's a great, great point. Yeah, who's fact-checking the fact-checkers? I always wonder. Yeah, yeah, that's a great point. Really good point. Yeah. Great point. Yes. Yep, and that's kind of why I gave the analogy of the cigarette you had to have a certain amount of decades to get enough data. And the same is happening now. We don't have enough time yet to know what the effects will be. Good point. Any others? Yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> right, right. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Fear of missing out is real, for sure. Yep. And you do feel like an exile even among peers that you would think would be with you. Um, just to tell you honestly, I am one of the only pastors I know who doesn't have a Twitter account. <laughs> so, and I respect those guys a lot who have one. I'm not saying they're bad. I just, I just don't have one. And uh, and sometimes I wonder, did I make a mistake? Did I just, am I like wrong? And maybe I am, but I don't have one. So anyway, yeah. Can I give you another one? Uh, just as a pastor, these things come up fairly often when couples come to me. That technology is driving a wedge between the ability for the husband and wife to spend time with one another. So very often I'm with people who in their bedroom, they come to bed with their phone in their hand and they lay in their bed and they fall asleep with their phone in their hand or they take it to the bathroom. And the like few minutes the husband and wife maybe would have to talk with one another, they don't, because that person's like, man, I really need this right now. And if that becomes the relationship for a long, sustained time, at some point you may realize the moments we would have had, we've squeezed out. So that one is a common one, I think, too. All right, let's go. To, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. I should have, yeah, that should be number 11 for sure. Yeah, that's a really good point. Escapism. Um, I didn't share the source, so I'd have to find where I found it. Have you ever seen a former smoker go like this? You know what they're doing, right? They're feeling for their cigarette pack that's not there anymore. Uh, they've done all these studies now with people who have cell phones that are like doing this, and they're, and they're touching the, the table. And the neuroscience, and I'm not a neuroscientist, is apparently exactly the same. So like that worker who needs that 15-minute smoke break, often now if you work in like a factory or something and you can't use your phone because it's a manual labor job, they need that 15-minute phone break, and the brain is doing the same like <sighs> feeling for them, which is really an interesting thought. Yeah, so that's a, a good point. All right, uh, letter A, goals. What do you want to get out of your technology? If it's actually there to serve you and not enslave you, what do you want to use it for? What do you think it would be useful for? Yeah, excellent. Good. Very good. Yeah. Live more independently. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. Great. Great. It's similar to what I wrote. Contribute to my vocational calling. So if I can use it with useful podcast or 
honestly, I have found, um, my wife is amazing. She does those old calendars that's like, you know, the big flat book and you write stuff. And then if something changes, you have to mark it out in pen and rewrite it. If I didn't have Google Calendar, I would miss every appointment. So that is a benefit for me, using it that way. Any others you can think of? All right, so um, let me read the last two things, and then I'll open discussion. If you want to share anything, if you have questions, if you want to critique something I said, which surely could be critiqued, I have no doubt, feel free to do any of that. But now let me read the last two things, and then we'll have a final Q&A or comment section. All right, you see the heading. The toothpaste is out of the tube. Is the situation hopeless? And I know I'm going to do a lot of reading here, okay? But try to, uh, if you don't mind, stay with it. Steve Allman puts it humorously for the New York Times Magazine, and he is definitely not a believer. Here's what he writes. Our children not only pick up on this fraught dynamic, they reenact it. We ostensibly limit our daughter, Josie, at age six, and our son, Judah, age four, to 45 minutes of screen time per day. But they find ways to get more, hunkering down with the videos Josie takes on her camera, sweet-talking the grandparents, and so on. The temptations have only multiplied as they move out into a world saturated by technology. Consider an incident that has come to be known in my house as the Leapster Imbroglio. For those unfamiliar with the Leapster, it is a quote-unquote learning game system aimed at four to nine-year-olds. Josie has wanted one for more than a year. My two best friends have a Leapster and I don't, she sobbed to her mother recently. I feel like a loser. My wife was practically in tears as she related this episode to me. It struck me as terribly sad that an electronic device had become, in our daughter's mind, such a powerful talisman of personal worth. But even sadder was the fact that I knew deep down exactly how she felt. Now this is the moment we live in, the one our childhoods foretold. When I see Josie clutching her grandmother's Kindle to play Angry Birds for the tenth straight time, or I watch my son stuporiously soaking up a cartoon, I'm really seeing myself as a kid. Anxious, needy for love, but willing to settle for electronic distraction to soothe my nerves or hold tedium at bay. And if experiencing this blast from the past weren't troubling enough, I also get to confront my current failings as a parent. After all, we park the kiddos in front of SpongeBob because it's convenient for us, not good for them. Quiet time, we call it. Let's please not dwell on how sad and perverse this phrase is. We make this bargain every day, even though our kids are often restless and irritable afterward. Still, I can't be the only parent feeling whiplash by the pace of technological changes, the manner in which every conceivable wonder, not just the diversions, but also the curriculums and cures, the assembled beauty and wisdom of the ages has migrated inside our portable machines. Is it really possible to hand kids these magical devices without somehow dimming their sense of wonder at the world beyond the screen? In the course of mulling this question, I stumbled across an old trope of videos on YouTube, naturally, in which parents proudly record their babies Operating iPads. One girl is nine months old. Her ability to manipulate the touchscreen is astonishing, but the clip is profoundly eerie. The child's face glows like an alien as she scrolls from app to app. It's like watching some bizarre inverse of Skinner's box in which the child subject is overrun by choices and stimuli. She seems agitated in the same way my kids are after quote unquote quiet time, excited without being engaged. As I watched her in action, I found myself wondering how a malleable brain like hers might be shaped by this odd experience of being the lord of a tiny two-dimensional universe and whether a child exposed to such an experience routinely might later struggle to contend with the necessary frustrations and mysteries of the actual world. Now read what he says at the end, and he is not a believer. The reason people turn to screens hasn't changed much over the years. They remain mirrors that reflect a species in retreat from the burdens of modern consciousness, from boredom and isolation and helplessness. But now, let me close with some Christian hope. So the next title is Christian Hope. And here, Anne Ajet, I found to be very encouraging. She writes, the Spike Jonze movie, Her, contains interesting insights into the intersection between humans and disembodied voices. In it, a lonely man named Theodore strikes up a relationship with a voice assistant similar to Alexa. Samantha is a sweet voice that Theodore comes to love, but he's left brokenhearted in the end. For while Samantha speaks of her love for him, her evolving abilities far eclipse Theodore's limited world. Samantha tells him, I used to be so worried about not having a body, but now I truly love it. I'm growing in a way I couldn't if I had a physical form. I mean, I'm not limited. I can be anywhere and everywhere simultaneously. 
I'm not tethered to time and space in a way that I would be if I was stuck in a body that's inevitably going to die. Now this prescient film wisely understands that even as a voice technology advances, no non-human disembodied voice will ever offer the true connection we need, as the New York Times columnist was opining. In the end, Samantha could not relate to Theodore because he, unlike her, was limited by a perishable body and finite intelligence. She didn't want to give that up for the sake of loving him. But notice the final paragraph. Thankfully for us, God did what Samantha would not. God loved us so much that he left heaven to take on human flesh in all its limitations, to dwell among us. God is not only a voice, one that speaks to us in creation, and even more directly in scripture, but an embodied presence, Emmanuel, God with us. And I think Ajet's article is a very good way to put her finger on what even the New York Times columnists are saying, boy, we wish there was some hope of a presence that would meet the desires of our souls. And the reality is that hope is God who has come in human form, limiting himself as the Son of God, Jesus Christ, veiled in flesh the Godhead we see. And so we should note that some of the uh, desires that people bring to technology can't be satisfied in technology, but are satisfied in God's Son, because he is, in fact, the closeness and proximity that we're longing. All right, I'll pray in just a minute. Our kids are just about done out there. But I want to open the floor for you. Seriously, any critiques, questions, or even just a thought or comment you had, anything you want to share that might be beneficial for us. All right, you're clamming up again. <laughs> All right, let me close this in prayer, and then we can dismiss and discuss with one another. Dear God, there is much more that I do not know than what I do know. Uh, and Lord, I hope some of this research can helpfully show us some of the longings that we have as humans that are ultimately unfulfilled by anything in this world. And so technology can be used in very good, affirming ways and give us the grace and ability to do that. But help us to never look to it for something that is a God-sized hole that nothing else can fill. Thank you, Lord, that some of the omniscience we try to gain from technology but never can quite put our finger on is something that you have. Thank you that the omnipresence that we sometimes try to fill in technology is something that you have. And so may we acknowledge, yes, we could put a tracking device on our children's phone, and there may be some merit in that, but there is a God whose eye sees everything. Yes, there may be times that we feel lonely, and so we turn to technology in a therapeutic way, and we ask it to make us feel better. But may we remember at those moments, there is a God that if we draw near to him, he will draw near to us. Lord, there, there, there may be times that we feel that how we're living uh, is, is unknown, and that we're, we're in this isolated anonymity, and that no one could ever relate to us. Remind us, Lord, that there is a great high priest who has been tempted in every way and can relate and empathize to our weakness. So remind us that there is someone who knows us and loves us and died for us. And so all of these longings are actually fulfilled in your son, Jesus. And Lord, honestly, I pray for Steve Allman, who wrote that New York Times column. And I pray for many of the men and women who I read who are sounding the alarm but don't know the solution. And so I pray that they would find it in our Lord. And I pray that you'd help us to be able to articulate that well, those of us who know the Lord. And any who don't, may they come to know him and his fulfilling power. In your son's name I pray. Amen. All right. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. <laughs>